शिवाय नम शिवाय नम शिवाय ओम नम शिवाय नम शिवाय नम शिवाय Adhikarna 6 No Departure for a Knower of Brahman Sutra 12 Pratishedhaditichenna Sharirat The organs do not depart Pratishedhadit Because of the scriptural denial Itichet If it be argued thus, then na not so, for the denial means that they do not depart. Sharirat, from the individual soul. Translation, if it be contended that the organs of the man of knowledge do not depart from the body because of the denial in the scripture, then, according to the opponent, it is not so, for the denial is about the departure from the individual soul. From the reservation made under the aphorism, and the immortality spoken of is one that is attained without burning ignorance, Sutra 427, it is admitted that in the absolute immortality there is an absence of any course to be followed and any departure from the body. Still, lest there be any apprehension of departure owing to some reason or other, that is denied through the text but the man who does not desire never transmigrates. Of him who is without desires, who is free from desires, the objects of whose desire have been obtained, and to whom all objects of desire are but the self, the organs do not depart. Being but Brahman, he is merged in Brahman. Brihadaranyakopanishad 4.4.6 now, since this denial occurs in the context of the supreme knowledge, the organs of the man who has realized the supreme Brahman have no departure from the body. The reply to this by the opponent is, No, since this denial is concerned with the departure of the organs from the embodied one and not from the body. Objection. How is this known? that the organs depart not from the body but from the embodied entity. Opponent. Because in the other Madhyandina branch, the fifth case ending is used in Tasmat from him, since the sixth case ending in Tasya of him in the Kanva recension is used to imply relationships in general. It can be delimited to a particular relationship on the strength of the ablative fifth case ending in tasmat in the other madhyandina recension. And by the word tasmat from him, the embodied soul that is qualified for secular prosperity or liberation is referred to, for it is the chief subject of the context. But not so is the body referred to. The idea implied is this, from him, from the individual soul that is about to depart from the body, the organs do not depart, they remain in its company. When the soul departs, it departs from the body along with the organs. Vedantin. This being the position, it is being refuted in Sutra 13. Spashto ye kesham. This is not so. He, because, e kesham, in the case of the followers of one branch, spashtaha, there is a clear denial of the soul's departure from the body. Translation This is not so. For in the case of the followers of one recension, there is a clear denial of the soul's departure. The assertion was made to the effect that even for the man who knows Brahman, there can be such a fact as departure from the body. 
the denial of departure having been made about the departure of the organs from the embodied soul. This is not correct, for the denial of the departure of the organs from the body is clearly met with in a particular recension. Thus, in the course of answering the question of Artabhaga, when this one, that is, the body of the liberated man, dies, do the organs then go up from this one, or do they not? It is stated from the point of view of the departure from the body. No, replied Yajnavalkya, Brihadaranyaka 3.2.11. Then, since the misconception might arise that in that case this one does not die because the organs do not depart, the assertion of the merger of the organs is made in they merge in this one only, Ibidam. And for establishing this fact, it is said, this one swells, this one is inflated, and in that state lies dead. Ibidum. Where swelling, etc., are asserted about something that is referred to by this one, saha, that is under discussion, and that forms the basis from which the departure can occur. Such descriptions fit in with the body and not the embodied soul. Namaste. So the poor opponent has gone off the deep end again. <laughs> this is a convoluted one because the argument is convoluted. He is asserting based on some grammatical case endings in a certain recension of uh, the Veda uh, in which the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad occurs, uh, that then he tries to say that when the soul leaves at the time of death, he doesn't take the organs with him, or he does, or what is he trying to say, actually? Huh? See, he is not a practitioner. He does not go through this process every night on his way to going to sleep, like a yogi would do. See, a yogi will withdraw the functions of the senses from the sense organs, in this case, the eye, to withdraw the power of vision or the function of vision from the eye means to see through the mind, isn't it? And this is exactly what dreaming is, seeing through the mind the functions of the senses, but without the sense organs. In other words, dreaming and death are the same. They're just part of different processes, different movements of the consciousness. Like I said last time, when you go into sleep, this movement is reversible. You wake up. But at the time of death, it's irreversible. When you wake up, you're in another body. <laughs> and in any case, between lives, one is in a dream body, a thought body, to put it another way. Thinking is dreaming, isn't it? Daydreaming. You're talking to yourself or you're visualizing something and modeling how it would work and so on. Like That's exactly what goes on in dreams. The mind is testing different models to see well, what are the consequences of this or that or, the, you know, whatever. So the mind is trying to anticipate or apprehend is maybe a good word. Uh, the consequences of any particular action in the world. Now, the mind is usually wrong, <laughs> almost all the time, actually. It's never fully correct. It may get part of the answer, but there's always a surprise, and that's one of the reasons why for people who are very conditioned, mentally conditioned, in other words, rigid in their thinking, uh, the world is full of mental suffering, 
because things always turn out differently than you imagine. Huh? Like just now I had to cut and make an edit because I was talking with my hands and I hit the microphone stand. <laughs> See, I only wanted to say something, you know, with my hands, right? But I missed and I hit the microphone stand, which makes a horrific noise, which I won't torture you with. <laughs> I cut it out instead. So when we see how Shankara responds to all these logical defects in the arguments of the opponent, Almost every time now, looking back at the last few uh, episodes, he brings in more context. And in this case, he brings out the conversation of Yajnavalkya with a Brahmin who was challenging him, challenging his knowledge by making up some far out questions that depend on a, uh, a tiny technicality in the scriptures. Well, that is, if the scripture is your primary source of knowledge, the only difference between the two explanations is grammar. And of course, grammar, being subject to logic, is open to various interpretations. So you can never actually reach a conclusion. This is one of the problems with logic. <laughs> but Yagyavalkya is realized. He knows. He sees directly. He doesn't need logic or books or anything at his stage. So he simply answers the question from his experience. And when the challenger brings up this very same argument or a very similar argument, what does he do? He brings in context. Let's take a look at this passage, these two verses, Brihadaranya Kopanishad 446 and 447. Yagyavalkya says, regarding this, there is the following verse. Being attached, he, together with the work, attains that result to which his subtle body or mind is attached. Exhausting the results of whatever work he did in this life, he returns from that world to this for fresh work. Thus does the man who desires transmigrate. But the man who does not desire never transmigrates. Of him who is without desires, who is free from desires, the objects of whose desire have been attained, and to whom all objects of desire are but the self, the organs do not depart. Being but Brahman, he is merged in Brahman. And then there's an extensive discussion in the commentary, which you should go and read because it really explains what this is all about. Then verse 7, regarding this, there is this verse. When all the desires that dwell in his heart, mind, are gone, then he, having been mortal, becomes immortal and attains Brahman in this very body. Just as the lifeless slough of a snake is cast off and lies in the anthill, so does this body lie. Then the self becomes disembodied and immortal, becomes the prana, supreme self, Brahman, the light, so Yajnavalkya brings it all home to what this is all really about. See, the logician can get caught up in all the grammatical and logical nuances of this scripture and that scripture. The practitioner cuts right to the quick and says what matters is that when the realized soul quits the body, he doesn't go anywhere. There isn't anywhere to go. He is Brahman and Brahman is everywhere. So he's already there. <laughs> you know, wherever you go, there you are because you are Brahman. But the questioner obviously doesn't know this. 
or at least he doesn't know it as a matter of experience, as a fact of everyday life. So he has to, you know, angle in this way and that way from different scriptures and try to figure it all out. Well, you can't figure it out because it's life and life is always unique and different. And it's never exactly the way that we read in any book or anything like that. That just gives the general case at best. It can never cover all the individual contingencies and exceptions and whatever. But direct knowledge can because it sees in real time what is really going on. There, I hit the mic cord that time. <laughs> so what we're saying is the actual self-realization is not contingent. It's not dependent on anything, on any context, because it is the greatest context possible, Brahman. So when the knower of Brahman leaves the body after exhausting the reactions of his present work, boom, he's gone. He doesn't go anywhere. Both the Buddha and the Upanishads mentioned this, that you cannot follow the trail. You cannot stalk. You cannot uh, determine the way that the realized soul goes when he leaves the body. And of this it was said uh, of Krishna, that when Krishna left his earthly body, that only Lord Shiva could see where he went or how he went. This is because he simply merged into transcendence. Aum Tat Sat, Aum Shaktihi Aum, Aum Namah Shivaya. And I forgot to say this. <laughs> context creates meaning. And awareness of context depends on memory. So memory depends on having the correct definitions of the terms. Because you will find that if you have incorrect definitions, you cannot remember. You cannot reconstruct this knowledge. So as I've been saying for like more than 10 years, and nobody really believes me, if you don't know the definition of the words, you don't know their meanings. You're guessing. And sometimes you're going to guess wrong. But these statements of the Upanishads are like mathematical formulae. Every term has a precise, exact meaning. And that meaning is dependent on context. What is the context? All of it. The all of the Vedas. My God, what human mind can hold all this? And there isn't one, I don't think, these days. <laughs> but Shankaracharya was certainly like that. Vyasadeva was certainly like that. Huh? And for this reason, they are regarded as divine incarnations. But, you know, us earthlings, us, us human people, well, let, let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a joke. Guy goes to the doctor and says, Doc, I got this terrible memory problem. I can't remember anything after a few minutes. I always forget. And the doctor says, hmm, well, that could indicate something serious. How long have you had this memory problem? Huh? What memory problem? You see, <laughs> lack of context makes things meaningless. The doctor's question was meaningless to the guy because he had forgotten the context. Due to his short-term memory problems, must be smoking too much weed or something. But anyway, this is also the problem with one who is simply dependent on the scriptures. All his knowledge is contingent on words and logic and grammar and stuff like that. And that's all limited by nature. So how can it be used to comprehend the unlimited? 
that's why you have to make some time and sit down and do these practices and actually attain these realizations. Om Tat Sat.